Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast and help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons Facebook page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be speaking with Miriam Lancewood, author of Woman in the Wilderness, a true story of survival, love and self-discovery in New Zealand. My name is Miriam Lancewood. Uh, I was born in Holland, actually, but I've now lived already for 10 years in New Zealand. And in 2010, we left civilization to live in the wilderness. And my husband and I lived for six years in the mountains in the southern Alps of New Zealand. We lived of hunting and gathering. Uh, we slept always in a tent, but always different places. So we moved around nomadically. And we cooked in a fire and um, we saw lots of beautiful, beautiful places in the in the South Island, New Zealand. And um, I wrote a book about those six years. It's called Woman in the Wilderness. And um, yeah, it's been translated into different languages. And uh, yeah, so that's a little short introduction. I mean, it is incredible what you have done. But I'd love for you to take us back to the early list. So you said that you grew up in Holland what was your life like in Holland? Were your, did you come from like an outdoorsy family? Were you always into travel? Were you a nomadic family? What were your early years, early years like? Pretty normal, really. I grew up in a little village in the east of Holland. And uh, my parents really liked music and art and theatre and all that. And in the summer holidays, we used to go to France and go wild camping. And my parents liked to um, light a little fire and wash in the river. And I really enjoyed that. I never thought that that would be my life, though. I thought that's something you do in holidays. And then you go back to your normal life and have a job and uh, make money and live in a house. When was the first time that you headed off to go traveling? I studied to be a physical education teacher in Holland. And straight after my studies, I was only 21, I went to Africa because I wanted to be a sports teacher there. And I did that for a year and I didn't really like it. I thought I have studied for four years for something and now I, and now I don't like it and I have to do this the rest of my life. So uh, that was quite a painful insight. Anyway, uh, when I came back to Holland, I thought maybe I should go traveling like my sister in India. So I went traveling and that was so nice, such a sense of freedom. And I felt so safe in India compared to Africa. And uh, it was such a good time. And after five months, I met Peter, who is now my husband. And we started traveling together from that moment onwards. Tell me more about Peter and traveling. and Because you, you traveled around India for about five years, didn't you? He did, yeah. So his story was amazing. So I was 22 at the time and he was 52. And um, he was telling me all about his life. He used to be a university professor in New Zealand where he was born. And he looked out of the window and thought, this is not living. That is living. <laughs> he looked out of the window. And he resigned from his job and gave a um, say goodbye party and said to his colleagues, you got to live this stuff, not just write about it. And so he saw this house and all his belongings, and just with a little backpack, he went to live in India. And he lived already for five years in India, just surfing the ocean and climbing the Himalayas for five long years before I met him. So I never met a person like that. <laughs> it's like he was like the embodiment of adventure. It was amazing. You headed off together to go and hike in the Himalayas, is that right? Or you travel through Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea? Yeah, both. So I um, I was looking for somebody to travel the Himalayas with, and there and Peter was looking for somebody to travel with and climb the mountains. And so um, that was really great. So that's the first thing we did together. We traveled for two months and we climbed eight mountain ranges. And Peter said we're going to travel just like the Himalayan shepherds, meaning. We don't take a tent. We don't take cooking equipment. We don't take anything, just some dried food and like raisins and nuts and some chapatis. 
and uh, climb over the mountains. Then come in another village and then eat with the families and they make another stack of chapatis and we climb over another mountain. So the way of travel was radically different from anything I ever heard of. Anyway, we traveled the Himalayas, which is great. And then we traveled slowly to New Zealand, overland. It took us about two years. We ended up in Papua New Guinea. And we thought, oh, we just done the Himalayas, so we're really very tough. <laughs> and um, we thought we're going to tra- walk from north to south Papua New Guinea and then jump on a boat to Thursday Island and go to Australia. And that went completely wrong. We were very ill-prepared. We didn't have the right gear. And we both got sick with malaria and Peter nearly died because he had two strains of malaria. It was very close. So that was a disaster. But he survived and um, we ended up in Australia and eventually New Zealand. Oh, my goodness. There's (laughs) there's so much going on. Absolutely crazy. I mean, (laughs) is this the life that you dreamed about? Not really, because... If you think about it, what do you dream of? Things that you know, right? Things that you read about. I never read about this sort of life. (laughs) I read about being a volunteer in Africa and being a sports teacher. So I was always dreaming of doing that. And I never thought of living in the wilderness or traveling for years and years on end. And, um, yeah, no, it just sort of happened. You made it to New Zealand. And is that where you decided to set up your base permanently? Well... I had to get New Zealand residency in order to stay longer than, say, a year. So uh, I had to work for one year as a teacher. So I did that. And after that year, I had residency. So that's the only year that I actually worked for like normal, a normal income, normal nine to five job. And um, during that year, I thought, well, this is really miserable. Keep in mind that we had just been traveling for all those years, right? And so uh, it was a bit of a shock to the system. So in that year, every weekend we went tramping, hiking in the mountains. And we did want to come back on Sunday afternoon to live in a house, to have a job, to work for something we were not really interested in in the first place. And so that's when the idea was born, why don't we go and do something extraordinary and live for four seasons, uh, one whole year in the wilderness. So that's what we set out to do. Initially, it was just one year. How are you affording your your lifestyle? How are you affording to live? Yeah, when I was working for one year, obviously I saved every cent. I didn't spend anything. And Peter has savings as well. And so we basically lived on $100 a week. Now, how much pound that would be, I don't know. Let's say 75 euro a week. Uh, that ju- is just for food and very basic food like flour and rice and lentils and so we need very, very little because we don't have any technology. In those, let's talk about those six years in the wilderness. In those years, we had no technology, no bills at all, no transport cost. <laughs> and was, we were hunting and gathering. So indeed, the costs are very low. So you had this dream to head out for one whole year tramping in New Zealand. You've worked for your year. You've got your residency. You've saved all your money. You've got the savings. What happened when you headed out? Tell us more about, did you have much of a plan or as a structure? Was it much more go with the flow? Tell us more about that year. So, yeah, let's start at the beginning. I used to be a vegetarian. My mother never cooked meat. So um, I'm not very used to eating meat, (laughs) uh, let alone hunting. But we had this plan of living in the wilderness, and uh, I had met a bow hunter. And the moment I saw that guy, I thought, I want to do that too, because it looked really cool. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to buy a bow and practice on a target in the garden. And when we set out to live in the wilderness, I will go hunting. So I practiced every day, um, and I shot 30 arrows on a target. And uh, that went really well after a year. And I thought, right, I'm very good at this. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> you feel this coming. The moment we went into the forest, I set out with my bow and arrows and I did not see any animals because it's a, an art to hunting. I could shoot an arrow on a tiger, but it's totally different from hunting. And I completely failed. I didn't see any animals. And if I did see something, I shot on the stones and then the arrow was bent a little bit so I wouldn't shoot straight anymore. So And they're very expensive. So it was a disaster. So the hunting was really hard. And in the beginning, we just ate beans and rice and a lot of lentils. 
But we set out in May, which is autumn in New Zealand, Southern Hemisphere. And so it became very cold very quickly. And we um, woke up in the morning with hunger pains because the rice and lentils was not enough to uh, get us through the night. Then Peter said we need to catch possums. Now, possum is sort of an animal from Australia. It's an introduced animal. It does very well there, but here it became a total pest. So they are regarded like rats here, and no one would eat a possum except us. <laughs> it's sort of the size of a cat. It has a very fluffy and beautiful fur, and it has a little pouch like a kangaroo. So I think it's a nice animal. But uh, we trapped, we learned to trap those possums, and that was quite a learning curve. So we ate a lot of possums that first winter until I began to be more successful with hunting during that year. But the very first day, so we set ourselves up with uh, buckets in the ground with enough food to survive on because we didn't rely on hunting right in the beginning, right? Because um, I was sure I needed a little bit of time to learn. And uh, a friend had dropped us off right in the mountains, four days' walk from the nearest road, with 12 buckets for a whole winter. That was enough for three months. And the first day we said, well, this is wonderful. What a beautiful place. And aren't we lucky to be here? Then the second day, I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? There is nothing to do here. And I was struck with the fear of I'm going to get very bored here. And I discovered it takes about two weeks for the mind to slow down in order to meet the rhythm of nature. And in those two weeks, you feel very bored and restless. And that was quite a learning curve. Luckily, Peter was there to tell me, you, Miriam, you need to learn the art of doing nothing. And uh, that was exactly right, because nature is so much slower in rhythm, and it's a totally different world from the, um, from the town and cities. What do you do during the day? Like, what's the, what's, Could you sort of describe the typical day of what it looks like? Well, we live for six years in the wilderness, and every year we try to think of doing something different, a different way of living. So in our last year, we walked a, a long walk called the Tiararoa Trail. It's 3,000 kilometers. It goes all the way from the top of New Zealand to the bottom. And so we are every day very busy with walking. <laughs> but it's totally different from, the say, the first year. The first year we were just in one place for three months, so it's very, very quiet. And in those days, we had plenty of time to sit around the fire, cook our food, cook our goat, go hunting, and go exploring. So we just walk up a side valley and uh, sort of scramble up a, um, a stream, up a waterfalls, come to little lakes on top of mountains. We go to places no one might never have seen. And uh, yeah, you feel like an explorer on those days. It's fantastic. How is your health out in the wilderness? Is it, is it a challenge to keep clean, clean and healthy? Yeah, I always feel very clean in the wilderness and very dirty in houses. You have to spend so much time cleaning everything up. In a forest, it's, it's just, it feels very clean. Um, so we always camp near a river. And the river is our water supply, our shower, and we wash in the river, wash the dishes in the river. And uh, every day that it is sunny, we do a little bit of washing. And when it's raining, we obviously don't touch the water because you never know when it's going to be dry again and when it's going to be sunny. But um, I feel very clean. And when we come out, which is sometimes once in like four times a year, sometimes every two weeks, depends on what we're doing. When we come out in a, in a town, that's when we might get a cold because you get a cold and flu from other people, right? Yeah. So uh, the most dangerous thing is coming back to civilization. I'd love to know, how do you handle your periods and menstruation when you're, when you're out in the wilderness? The first years I had the pill, so I knew when I was going to get a period. I never had very uh, heavy periods, so that was lucky. But I had a moon cup, and that's very handy. It had caused no problems at all. And I always think, well, you know, women have survived this way for so many years, <laughs> for generations and generations. So it's obviously a natural thing to live in nature. And the same for learning how to hunt. I thought maybe I have to, um, you know, it's a struggle to learn, and it was in a way. But also a lot of these things come instinctively, and I feel they are in my blood, in my genes, because our ancestors survived this way, right? 
how do you keep in contact with your friends and family and what do they think about this sort of alternative way of living? Oh, let me explain that right now we're living sort of off grid because right now I'm writing my second book. And I only have to walk down three kilometers to a house of a friend where I am right now. And I'm in the Wi-Fi. So right now I just uh, send emails, no problem at all. But when we were living in the wilderness, I wrote letters just on pen and paper. And when we saw a hunter, I quickly finished the letter. And this letter is like 12 pages or something, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. (laughs) I put the letter in the envelope. I put stamps on the envelope and give the letter to the hunter. I just ask him to put, to post it in the nearest town. And that's when the letter flies to Holland, where my parents live. And um, they open the letter. And what do they smell? Smoke. Because everything smells of smoke. All our hair, clothing, uh, everything, even the pen and paper. So uh, that's very authentic. So they get long letters from me, and that's how I keep in touch. And then they reply with an email. And when we do our next shopping, which is much, much later, uh, I will go to the nearest library and find a computer, which is not easy to find these days, and open my inbox and find their email. So you were 22 when you met Peter and he was 52. So there's there's, there's quite a large age gap. How do you handle that now that you, because how old are you now? I'm now 36. So we've been 14 years together and Peter is 66. How does it work now that now that Peter's getting older? So I met him when I was 22. Had I met him in Holland, I would have thought he's way too old. <laughs> but in India, you can um, just do about just about anything and everybody is a little bit crazy. And uh, so I felt the freedom there to um, be together. But because of the age difference, we um, never took each other for granted. Because he thinks I'm going to run off any moment with a younger person. And I think he might get sick and die. And uh, so we take um, every, we try to enjoy every day. And I think this is the key for a very good relationship in any case for us. <laughs> so in the beginning, he was like my guide. He took me over the Himalayas. He, uh, he knew everything. He took me into the wilderness. He knew his own country. It was absolutely important that one of us knew the weather, to read the weather, to knew all the dangers for river crossing, uh, lightning storms, fire, and all these things. And that was him. He knew all these things. But over the years, I've also learned a lot of things. And now in the last years, uh, we've done done some other travel and walking. And uh, slowly over the years, I am a little bit more, the roles have reversed a little bit. Like I carry more weight than him because he finds a heavy backpack very heavy. And, uh, yeah, so it's interesting to see that the things have changed a little bit. But, uh, yeah, sometimes he says, Miriam, don't you think I look a bit old these days? And I say, Peter, the day I met you, you looked old. (laughs) So it's obviously not a problem, because if you're 22, 52 is really old, right? (laughs) What made you want to write a book? I didn't. I never thought of writing a book. The strange thing is, when you are living a life, doesn't matter what, it becomes normal. So I never thought of, well, people people are interested in this because it's pretty normal. But we were staying with a friend. This was in 2016. This is after six years in wilderness. And uh, just staying for a short time in town uh, with a friend. And she said, why don't you write down one day of your life? And I thought, oh, yeah, why not? So it took me one month (laughs) to write two pages and was very excited about it. And I sent it to a magazine and one magazine took it uh, called Mind Food and they published it and they gave me $500 for it. I was over the moon (laughs) and uh, a publisher read this article and she contacted me saying, are you interested in writing a book? And I thought, writing a book? I only done two pages and I'm not a writer and I'm Dutch and I can't write in English. And anyway, she said, okay, just give it a try, write uh, two chapters and see how you go. And um, she was very happy with those two chapters. And then she gave me a contract to write the rest of the book. So that's when our life changed dramatically. (laughs) How did did your life change? What happened next? 
Well, then the book came out and they organized a lot of publicity. So suddenly had all these camera crews in our camp. And suddenly I became very quickly quite famous in Holland. And um, it became a huge success and a bestseller in Holland and in New Zealand and translated into German and French and Chinese and Dutch. So I wrote it in English and it was translated into Dutch, which is quite funny. Yeah, since then we've sort of been in the eye of the media a little bit. But... um, and doing a lot of podcasts and <laughs> interviews. And uh, it's been great. It's just another adventure. And when you were writing your book, how, how were you writing it? Were you, just, were you just sort of coming back to your friend's house once a week? Were you writing on paper and then somebody else was, was typing it up for you? How did that work? Oh, yeah, no, it's a serious business, writing. So uh, the publisher asked me to write a book. That was in 2016. And we said, okay, but now we have to find a house with electricity to write. How are we going to do that? And we generally in life, we just trust on randomness, like something will come up and help us out. And indeed, when I went hitchhiking for food supplies, a woman picked me up and she said, "Uh, what are you doing Uh, for a job? That's what they always ask. And I never know what to answer. (laughs) Anyway, no one knew what to answer. I said, I'm a writer and I'm looking actually for a little house to write in. And said, oh, on my farm, I've got a little cottage. You can live there if you like for free. So I said, brilliant. We'll move in next week. So we did that and we stayed in that little cottage. It was very primitive, no hot water or anything, <laughs> but at least electricity. So we stayed five months in that little cottage while I was writing my first book. And my friend gave me a laptop and we had no Wi-Fi, but it didn't matter. I was just writing the story. And, uh, yeah, after five months, I sent a manuscript to the publisher, New Zealand publisher, and uh, then we went back into the forest. Living in the wilderness, you're obviously, you're almost removed from the, from the stress of normal life. But there must be, are, are there stresses in the wilderness? None. There is no stress. Uh, except, um, yeah, a lot of people suffer from anxiety, right, in the city for whatever reason, financial or stress or bullying at work, I've recently heard about. But in the wilderness, is no stress at all. And that's why Peter and I can live together so harmoniously, because we don't fight about anything. There's nothing to fight about. The only thing is when there is a lightning storm, we are terrified. We are thinking the branches coming down from the trees and might kill us anytime. But that fear is only short-lived. Because the next morning it's all clear sky again and everything is fine again. Same for crossing a river. Sometimes I'm terrified and I think I'm going to drown in that river. But the moment I'm on the other side, it's fine. So I think that's a big difference. I have fear, but that's only short term. You mentioned that you ended up walking or tramping the Tiroroa Trail. Tell us more about that walk, you know, 3,000 kilometers, the full length of New Zealand. Yeah, it's a very popular trail right now. But when we did it, the trail had only just opened. So only 100 people finished the trail and lots more people, three times more, uh, start. Uh, Many people, of course, um, can't handle it and drop out because it's very tough. It was amazing to begin a trail and thinking, all right, we've got another 3,000 kilometers to go. Uh, you can't think that way. you got to think, okay, I'm going to walk a few kilometers and then we sit down for lunch. And just think very short term, because otherwise it's too overwhelming. 3,000 kilometers is a hell of a long way. But we took it easy. We've got an ocean of time. So it doesn't matter if it takes us three months or 10 months. And we took 10 months. Other people take three or four. (laughs) So we walk. And when I shoot a possum or a rabbit or a goat, we stop and eat our goat. And a goat lasts us sort of five days. So we just take it easy and um, eat. And then we feel uh, strong again. Then we carry on walking. So uh, it's a really a great life. I love the long walking. That's what it's called, long walking. What do you think the biggest lesson is that you've learned over the past few years of being nomadic and living this alternative lifestyle? Um, or many of the things, all written down in the book. <laughs> but one thing I re- recently realized is when, um, so let me explain. After the book came out in 2017, we left New Zealand and we walked 2,000 kilometers through West Europe and East Europe and Turkey. 
And my second book is about this journey. So in Turkey, we were contacted by a woman who had read a book and said, oh, I'd love to invite you in my home in Istanbul. And maybe after that, we can walk the Lycian Way together. We had never heard of the Lycian Way, but we go and see her, a very nice woman. And we went to the start of the walkway, the Lycian Way in the south of Turkey. And we started walking. And the first day, after the first day, she wanted the rest day. And the first day was only a three-hour walk. And we thought, oops, <laughs> she might not be physically capable of um, doing this long walk because it was 500 kilometers. It would take about a month or so or longer. And anyway, um, then the uh, weather came in and it was winter. And it was not so cold in Turkey, but very wet. And the weather came in and we uh, were in the middle of a thunderstorm and she was utterly, utterly miserable. And she said, I can't handle it. I want to go to a hotel. And then I thought, hey, this is interesting because our idea of freedom is that we, we think, we believe that the more we give up possessions, the more we toughen up, the more free we are. Where she believed the more money she had and the more she can afford going into the hotel, the more free she is. So then I realized actually our philosophy about freedom is hugely influential in our, our way of life. So, uh, yeah, this is what we believe. So um, the less possessions, the less uh, attachment, the less responsibility, the more free we are. So if we encounter a lot of tough weather or tough circumstances, we think, ah, this is a chance to become even more free. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is quite an interesting insight for me to realize this uh, in Turkey. Myself and a friend just came back from hiking the Lycian Way. We did it in... Um, oh, really? Yeah, we did it in November. How did you find it? Oh, very beautiful, but very wet. And um, it's a sort of everything, the whole surface all turned into a mud. I thought it was really miserable mud. I just don't like mud. Also because we walk in sandals, and sandals are not good for mud. But apart from that, it was so beautiful. The coast is stunning. We felt quite unsafe when it was like some of the rocks going over because it was so slippy when it was wet. And we were thinking, I don't think we necessarily want to do this in wet weather. Were you camping all the way? Yeah, because all the guest houses were closed. Not that we would ever go to a guest house. <laughs> uh, we don't have money for accommodation, but um, we camped out anyway. What did you do after that hike? Uh, we went back to Bulgaria. For more hiking? More hiking, indeed. And then we went to Australia. But you can all read about that in the second book. <laughs> <laughs> When's the second book coming out? Uh, Christmas. Oh, fantastic. So something, definitely something to look forward to. Have you, yeah, October, actually. Have you got any more plans to do any more nomadic traveling? Or are you pretty much sort of going to be based in New Zealand permanently now? Um, we loved uh, East Europe. We will certainly go back there. But... I have to deliver my manuscripts in April and I can't wait to leave everything behind and go back into the peace and quiet of the wilderness to leave everything behind and um, yeah, give back the cell phone. Somebody gave me, a friend, gave me a cell phone only six months ago and I am shocked how dependent I now am on replying and all the messages because of the writers' festivals I've been attending in the last six months. Just come back from Dubai and I was in Hong Kong, all over the world. <laughs> and those people say, Oh, um, can you write an article about uh, this and that? Oh, sorry, deadline is tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and I think, How would I even know this without my cell phone? And, you know, getting emails on my cell phone and uh, all those messages, what's happened there. Yeah. I'm so dependent on it. I'm shocked. Going back to sort of survival and surviving out in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you talked about sort of the hunting aspect of it. What, what was the biggest challenge for while you were out there? What was the biggest skill that you needed to learn? Yeah, hunting is the main thing. So in Europe, uh, there are a lot of fruits and nuts and all things you can collect and lots of edible plants. But in the Alpine in New Zealand, it's very, very little except for animals. So New Zealand used to be a bird island. It's only birds, no mammals at all. And then the English people came and brought animals to hunt because they thought, oh, what are we going to eat? Fair enough. So they brought the deer and the pig and the rabbit and the hare and um, the possum. And all these animals 
but they didn't have a natural predator here. So their numbers increased so much that it became, all of these animals became a plague and a pest. They do a lot of damage to the um, natural environment, the natural flora and fauna. So the government is encouraging people to hunt. So um, there are quite a few animals in the mountains, which is good for me and bad for the New Zealand plants. So um, hunting is the most important thing to learn here. And that's quite difficult. It took me about a year to really become confident with hunting. How did you learn how to skin and and cook and use the meat? Somebody showed me how to uh, skin an animal. And the principle of skinning is the same for every animal, funny enough. So uh, I learned that with a lot of trial and error. I mean, it's not rocket science, uh, but I got better over it over the years. Better than I don't know how to cook an animal because that's Peter's job. He is the cook. What are the roles in your relationship? Well, so he's the cook and I'm the hunter. Um, he does firewood and I do the tent, uh, like pitching a tent. And I do the bedding. He lights the fire. And I set up the tarp. So we have a tent and also a tarp in between the trees. So I do everything with ropes. I like ropes. Yeah, what else? Oh, he does the navigating, navigation, and I'll just follow. So I'm carrying all the, the heavy weight. So he is sort of, imagine, he is walking ahead of us, and, I mean, ahead of me, and he is reading the map, and he is carrying a light pack, like 15 kilos. And I'm sort of <laughs> bent over behind him <laughs> with a gigantic pack with 25 kilos. Oh, wow. Super strong, super strong. <laughs> yeah, and I'm getting stronger because of this heavy weight. But, um, yeah, it really helps if he does the navigation. What are your dreams for the future? Oh, I don't really have dreams. If we have a dream, we just do it. <laughs> so at the moment, I'm dreaming of writing a second book, and I'm nearly finished. If we want to go back in the wilderness, we do just that. There's no dream. <laughs> what can people expect from reading reading your first book? To see that... There is also a totally different way of living. Because when I went to school, they asked me, okay, do you want to become a doctor or a teacher or, you know, all these professions? And they never asked me if I want to be a woman in the wilderness, <laughs> if I want to learn how to hunt and live on the land. No, not at all. So there are different ways of living. And I think it could inspire people to do something different, not living in the wilderness perhaps, but to just give up their job and travel or do something totally different but the thing is what i always encourage is to work less and spend less and so we have more free time because i think the only real thing we have is our time of our time and our life right every day is a day less so if you waste another year that's just a terrible waste it's a year you never can get back so i encourage people and very many people that I meet on the street, I always say, you know, you know resign tomorrow <laughs> and sell your house. And with that money, you can do whatever you like as long as you live frugally and uh, don't live beyond your means. And are you, are you on social media? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I've never seen uh, – I don't exactly know what is Twitter, actually. I don't know that at all. I haven't seen uh, much of Facebook because if you're not part of Facebook, you can't get in. Yeah, it's quite exclusive, actually. And I heard of Instagram, but no, I'm not on all these things. I have posted some things on YouTube, though, and people subscribe, but they never get anything. <laughs> the last thing I posted was a year ago. It was a little uh, movie uh, to promote the book and that. But uh, no, but people can contact me via the website and the email comes straight to my inbox. Do you want to share the website? Yeah, it's just miriamlanswood.com. Just final words. Of, I mean, I know you just gave some sort of um, sort of advice, you know, resign. Resign from your job. Spend less money. Be more frugal. But for, <laughs> but, but I suppose for, for women out there who are thinking, it's just not possible. How, how can I do that? What would be the key takeaway that you would like women to learn from listening to you? I guess they don't know, a lot of people don't know what to do because their mind is confused. It's confused because they, a lot of people live in stress and anxiety and all that. But what I see mostly is that people are so sleep deprived. And if only they sleep a bit more, they would feel a totally different person. 
And then you will get more clarity and you see what is obvious to do. So, um, yeah, maybe just start with sleeping, the easiest thing in the world. And uh, apart from that, maybe just have every day, even if it's just one minute, be in nature, even in just in a park or in the backyard or have your dinner outside. If it's cold on the balcony, just have a uh, put on a coat and um, have some fresh air and see something green. I think that already is so beneficial for the mind. Absolutely. How, how many hours do, a night do you sleep? How many hours? Yeah. Well, in the winter, uh, it can be like 14 hours because we sleep when it's dark. We get up when it's light. In the summer, it's a lot less, maybe eight hours or so. So in the winter, it's like hibernation. I think it's so important. People want to skip winter and fly across the world for six months, six months. But it's um, really important to get that hibernation, I believe. God, it's fascinating. Miriam, you are an incredible woman uh woman in the wilderness incredible book everyone i'll add the link to make sure people can go and buy it best of luck with your second book about hiking uh, across europe and doing the lycian way absolutely incredible but thank you so much for coming on tough girl podcast to share more of your life it is honestly fascinating i don't, I don't think i've ever spoken to anyone like you <laughs> oh. <laughs> well thank you very much Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Miriam. What an absolute legend. It's such a different way of living. So it's absolutely fascinating to speak with her and I'd highly recommend you reading her book. Everything that we've talked about today will be in the show notes, which will be available at toughgirlchallenges.com. If you're brand new to the Tough Girl podcast, then I'd highly recommend you go and check out the main website. I like to think of it as like the main hub where all of the information is. So that's toughgirlchallenges.com. When you go and visit the, the main website, you can find more information about me and my background you can find more information out about the tough girl podcast it's been going since 2015 there are you know over 300 episodes now that you can go back and look through we also have tough girl extra which is when we go back and speak with our previous guests or members of the Tough Girl Tribe to find out what they've been up to. There's Seven Women, Seven Challenges, which we did way back in 2017, but it's still really, really fascinating to follow seven women from the Tough Girl Tribe to see what they achieved throughout that year. Go and check out the Tough Girl blog, which is where the show notes are held. There's also books and links to how to become a patron. There's links on all of my social media channels from YouTube to Twitter to Pinterest to Instagram, Facebook, etc. Just want to give um, a few shout outs to a couple of our previous guests that we've had on since uh, the beginning of the year. So we've spoken with Carmen Rendell, who's currently walking the entire coast of the British Isles in 2020 to raise um, the profile for walking ther- therapy. We've spoken with Fenella Langridge, who's a professional triathlete over the 70.3 distance. Ninka Ustra, who shared more about mountain biking the Great Himalayan Trail in Nepal, from Hilsa in the west to Palpu in the east, 1,700 kilometers and 85,000 meters of ascent. We also spoke with Christina Palton, who's a Swedish ultra runner who ran alone through Iran to overcome fears and prejudice, a 1,144 mile journey of trust. Um, there are there are so many episodes. <laughs> there, there's a huge amount of inspiration um, on the podcast. So we- So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. One of my missions, one of my passions is to increase the amount of female role models in the media. I believe it's so important that if women can see and hear other women doing physical challenges and going on adventures, that it'll make them start to think, well, hold on, she's just like me. And if she can do it, then what can I do? And so this is what I'm, this is my mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, to encourage other women to get fit and active, to travel and explore, to have big dreams and to live their life to the fullest. Now, if you have been impacted by the Tough Girl podcast, if it has inspired you, if you have learned something from it, if you have changed your life because of the Tough Girl podcast, please pay it forward. $2 a month, $5 a month will make a massive difference in the work that I can do in this space. I am so grateful to the 267 patrons who are supporting the mission of the Tough Girl podcast. Become one of them. Let's increase that to 300 patrons by the end of the year. That will be absolutely amazing. So please do take the time, go and visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast and sign up as a patron. Um, I would really, really appreciate it. And just think of the good that you'll be doing in the world. But have an awesome day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it and just live your life. You've got one life. You've got to live your life of your dreams. All right, I'll speak to you next Tuesday. Lots of love. Bye.